you can see them. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm Michelle Marie Pena. I am a neonatologist at Emory in the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And I'm really thrilled today to be here to talk about specifically kangaroo care in the NICU. And so I know that folks will be joining in as we, as I um, begin this talk um, and welcome input um, and questions throughout this presentation. Obviously, we'll have some time at the end. Um, as also in an adult learning spirit, um, this will not take the whole hour. And so I um, hope that you'll be able to stay really engaged um, during this presentation. <clears throat> if it goes. Yeah, there we go. Uh, all right. So it's, um, the I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, the, well, I hope to talk about today is to talk about kangaroo care in the NICU and then zoom in and talking about kangaroo care in the state of Georgia um, and present to you a gap QC audit that we're going to be um, launching this month to collect baseline data in our NICUs here at Georgia, in Georgia. And so just for some level setting, wanted to talk a bit about kangaroo care to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. Um, and so kangaroo care is also called skin to skin care, and it involves placing a naked baby with a diaper on a pair on a parent's bare chest. Um, I had a lot of fun picking out photos of babies um, during kangaroo care. And actually, this is one of the most amazing pictures. This is one of the babies that was born um, at um, less than 300 grams here doing skin to skin care with their parent. There's a really touching history um, with kangaroo care, um, and I wanted to share a little bit about you, about kangaroo care. It was actually um, developed by a Colombian pediatrician um, in, the, in the country of Colombia um, named Dr. Edgar Ray, and he introduced it in 1978, and he worked at a newborn unit in Colombia in an area with a lot of poverty that was responsible for delivering over 30,000 babies a year. As you can imagine, there was a lot of overcrowding. There were not enough incubators. There was a lot of cross infection. The death rate, the mortality was really high. Um, and so I took an excerpt from this article um, just to share it with you to just give a little bit history of where this came from. Um, he ended up coming upon a paper on the physiology of the kangaroo. And again, I acknowledge babies are not kangaroos, but I do think this is really beautiful history. Um, it mentioned that at birth, kangaroos are bald and roughly the size of a peanut, very immature, just like a human preterm baby. And once in the once in the mother's pouch, the kangaroo receives thermal regulation from direct skin to skin contact afforded by its lack of hair. It latches onto the mother's nipple where it remains until it's grown roughly a quarter of its mother's weight when it's finally ready to emerge into the world. So this struck a chord with Ray, with Dr. Ray, who went back to his institute and decided to test it out. And he trained mothers of premature babies to carry them as kangaroos do. And the results were remarkable. Death rates and infection levels dropped immediately. Overcrowding was reduced because hospital stays were much shorter. Incubators were freed up and the number of abandoned babies fell. Um, so this, this intervention really came was developed really out of desperation. Um, and so um, this model has really evolved over time, um, but the kangaroo remained sort of at the center of this model. And it was this paper here, um, I wanted to highlight this statement where it was selected to illustrate three key components of the model, warmth, breast milk, and love. Um, and so it's really an incredible low tech um, intervention that I wanted to talk with you a bit about today. And so just briefly um, going through benefits, there are going to be um, more details um, and more of an overview through the micro lesson that will be released later. Um, but just some high level review. Um, when we talk about infants, especially in thinking about how in the in the context with which it was developed, it's been studied rigorously and shown um, improved mortality in developing countries. Um, even in more um, advanced countries, we do see a lot of physiologic benefits, specifically with respiratory stability, improved thermal regulation, possibly some decreased cortisol levels, and increased oxytocin levels in babies. Um, and it's also been studied in the context of painful procedures like heel sticks, and it may res um, kangaroo care may um, decrease pain response and recovery. There are um, like a myriad of benefits for parents as well. As you can imagine, it's been studied and it's been shown to improve bonding, attachment, maternal depressive symptoms, reducing parental stress, improving parental engagement and self-esteem, improved parental 
reasons why it's relevant to our GAP QC initiative is it's also associated with longer and more exclusive breastfeeding, improved milk volumes. And all in all, all of these parental benefits promote future preterm de- infant neurodevelopment as well as family well being. Mm-hmm. However, there are barriers that that units and providers need to take into consideration in the NICU. One being perceived perceived concerns for safety, so variable comfort with um, lines that babies may have, vascular access lines, concern for potential unplanned extubation, fear of compensation, decompensation, and then also um, barriers may be that parents may not be able to visit as much as they would want to. They may be fearful of carrying babies um, and may feel less empowered to be able to um, engage with their baby and interact with their baby using kangaroo care. Still with all of these benefits, kangaroo care has been widely recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics, DAP, the National Association of Neonatal Nurses, NAN, and the WHO, the World Health Organization. And I wanted to highlight a few pieces from the AAP. So there's actually a whole clinical report that's dedicated to skin to skin care for term and preterm infants in the NICU. Um, and this PDF, this publication was from 2015. Um, and you could see here, oops, let me put the screen. Um, I had I pulled some relevant quotes. So one one you know, a big take home was really that because skin to skin care has been shown to be feasible and safe in the NICU in infants as young as 26 weeks gestation. Caveat for that is that they say 26 weeks gestation. This was a 2015 publication. Um, Again, this is because of benefits for both parents and infants, as I've reviewed. Facilities are encouraged to offer this care when possible. The clinical report goes on to say that both parents can be encouraged to provide skin to skin care with appropriate guidelines and protocols for both preterm and term infants in the NICU and then highlights that despite apparent physiologic stability during skin to skin, it's still prudent that infants in the NICU have continuous cardiovascular monitoring and that care be taken to monitor correct head positioning for airway patency, as well as the stability of the endotracheal tube, arterial and business access devices and other life support equipment. And so um, after reviewing this um, background, Hopefully, I've brought home the concept that kangaroo care and skin-to-skin care has many benefits for parents and infants, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir. The tricky part is is that we don't really know if this is happening consistently across Georgia NICUs. Um, And even in the literature that exists, which is very limited, there's a wide variation NICU to NICU. Um, And since we don't know if it's happening, we don't really know if there's an opportunity to improve the uptake of this practice. And so I'm here today to share with you a pilot data collection process that we'll be starting with Georgia NICUs and the GAP QC. And again, why are we discussing kangaroo care? Again, it's a critical breastfeeding support practice and it's in alignment with the OA, with the Optimizing Newborn Nutrition Initiative. So much so that it's on our key driver diagram, which we're revisiting here on this slide. And you can see here, kangaroo care is one of the interventions um, and a critical breastfeeding support practice. Also, um, like I mentioned, it could serve as a baseline for our future work. Um, In fact, other PQCs, including the Florida PQC, has done a whole initiative centered around kangaroo care with a lot of great success. And so to start, we wanted to start our GAP QC audit with level two to four NICU infants. And again, this is sort of a pilot to get our baseline data and see where we are in our state. And so we've designed this audit to be as low burden as possible. And we employed the Vermont Oxford Network Day, so Vaughn Day Quality Audit Strategy, where we're basically going to do random audits similar to how um, we've been doing um, audits for our current initiative. This one's going to be, it's, this one, however, is going to be a limited audit and it's going to be one day a week for four weeks. So it's going to be four total days and units will be maxed out at providing 30 infants per audit day. So if you have a really large unit, you would just pick 30 infants for that particular day. And we're really trying to capture any skin to skin that's being provided by, by parents and then also parent visitation, because we can't do skin to skin if parents aren't there. So we're trying to, to get capture those two elements, parent visitation and skin to skin. 
And so we've designed this audit process to have two parts, and I'll review them in detail. So the first part will be this paper tool that will be filled out by, by bedside nurses. So the, the daytime and the evening bedside nurse to capture a 24-hour period. Um, if your unit does collect this in the EHR, you could also just use your EHR. And then we're also going to capture some infant characteristics that are again very basic um, data points that your that bedside nurses would know, um, or you could use your EHR if you prefer. So there's this tool, paper tool, and then there's going to be the data input, which would be using this Excel sheet template that we that, that I'll show you. Um, and again, it's meant to be um, very low burden, and we would have you submit that Excel sheet for that um, for that one audit day um, at a time. And so this is a snapshot of the audit tool and I'll zoom in. Um, so this is really the most important data that we're trying to capture. Um, so you'll see here, um, we have instructions for um, the bedside nurse to, to fill this out at the end of the day um, or at, and at the end of the night shift um, and it'll be picked up the next morning. We would have people fill out the bed, the bed number, no name, no PHI, no protected health information. And then if there's multiples, twins, triplets, quads, um, we would have only one infant to have data collected. Um, and this is really the main ask. So we'll have for day shift, did the parent visit? Yes or no? Did skin to skin occur? Yes or no? And then night shift, same questions. Did the parent visit? Yes or no? And then did skin to skin occur? Yes or no? Again, we're trying to make this low burden and easy. We know that everyone is so busy and units are very busy. Um, as a part of this audit tool, we also have some patient characteristics um, that we're, we're um, collecting. So it would be how old the baby is in days, the baby's gestational age, their birth weight, what respiratory support they're on, um, the highest that day when the audit day started, um, vascular access, whether the baby needed, or sorry, not the baby, the baby, okay. um, whether the parents needed interpreter services. And then we would ask that you go to the patient's chart to figure out um, or to at, pull, extract the race of the baby's mother and then also the ethnicity of the mother. And so I actually piloted this process um, at our Grady NICU um, and was um, and I did this in August and was pretty low key. And I'll share some um, date, data from this. Um, when I went in that morning, I alerted the morning charge nurse, as well as our CNS, um, Aisha Alibi, if you're here, thank you for your help. Um, it took us 30 minutes to pass out this audit to our unit that had over 30 babies that day. We, it took us, um, and really 30, the 30 minutes was instructing about the audit, which I'll go in more depth, uh, into more depth. And then the nurses told the, the evening nurses to fill out the audit. And then in the morning, it took me seven minutes to walk around the unit to pick it up. I did have the help from the charge nurse to mainly remind the night, night shift about filling out the form. So again, it's meant to be quick and, and easy. And then I mentioned, so there's two parts, the audit tool, the paper form or EHR, and then collecting to actually input the data. We've created an, uh, an, Excel, um, an Excel form for this. So you would fill out the hospital name, your data, um, your name, whoever's collecting the data, um, the data contacts name and email. We'll have um, a sheet for your day one. So you'll put the day, day of the audit and the census of that day. And then you would basically input all of the data that is on that one page sheet for, for baby. And we've had we've created this sheet so that um, it's again as easy as possible. So you shouldn't have to type as much. Um, more so, we'll have selection um, things that you can select to make it as easy as possible to put in. And so, just to walk you through an example of what this audit process would look like for somebody that for a unit that's using the paper form, this is a slide that would go through the prep work. Um, and so the primary steps would be to schedule the four audit days that you will be conducting this audit um, on your unit and notifying your nursing leadership. You would print the audit tool paper forms, um, familiarize yourself with where you would be able to find the mother's race and ethnicity data. So if you have an EHR um, or you're in, in your delivery hospital, sort of looking through the where it is that you could extract this, um, or if it's something in an H&P, for example, 
Um, you would then decide where you would want to have this audit tool to live for 24 hours. Yes. Yeah, number eight. Hello there. Thank you for muting. Um, so for example, um, the way we did it at Grady, so I'm, what I'm referring to is um, this paper tool, you would want the daytime nurse to fill out and the nighttime nurse to fill out. And so finding a place by the baby where this form can be for a 24 hour period. Um, and it would also be where you would pick it up the next day. So at Grady, for example, we use the bedside table since we have a bedside table for every infant. And then key, of course, will be who's going to re be responsible for distributing this audit tool and also collecting and inputting the data. So that's the prep work. And then the actual audit process really entails um, these five steps. So one, having this Weber's designated as the audit lead walk around the unit in the morning and hand out the audit tool to the bedside nurse. That person would orient the nurse to the audit tool. You would fill out the bed number on the top. And ideally, you can even just get a, get um, finish the infant characteristics by just filling them out together. Review where the mother's race and ethnicity um, can be found in the chart and fill that out there. And that way, all that the nurse would need to do is fill out the, the, the two questions during her shift. Did parents visit and did skin to skin occur? And then she would instruct the nighttime nurse to fill out the same questions on the night shift row. In the morning, the audit lead, lead would pick up the forms and make sure that the data is complete and then put it into that Excel sheet I just reviewed, reviewed, send the Excel sheet to Laura. And then the last step is to do this for three additional audit days. And so, like I mentioned, it's, the goal is to do it for four 24 hour periods in four different weeks. And ideally, if your unit can, to do one during the one during a weekend day, if you can. But we totally we understand that that may not be possible. But as you can imagine, the visitation patterns over the weekend can be different than the visitation patterns during the week. So that's the reason why we make that recommendation. And really, we we'll leave it up to the sites to pick the audit days that work best for you. And so I'll go over the calendar in the next slide. And so this is the timeline that we've um, developed. So today is October 8th, as Laura reminded us. Um, we're doing this education and this data training on kangaroo care. There's going to be a, king, a recording and a one pager that we'll send out after this. As Laura mentioned, we also have a office hours on October 17th where we can talk more and are here to support units. And then our goal is to have the audit go live on October 20th. Um, and have the period end on November 23rd. Um, and really, again, the goal is for folks to pick four total days. So there's five weeks here. So you would pick one day out of these five weeks, or one day per week um, over this period. Um, and ideally, we'll complete these audits before Thanksgiving. Our goal is then obviously to be share the data with you and your sites, to have direct feedback with your site, and then also present our data in, um, in aggregate to see how we're doing um, and use this as a baseline. And of course, um, we appreciate all of the participation and we'll be sure to celebrate participating centers at the GAPS UC annual meeting that Laura just reviewed. And so again, um, why are we doing this audit? This is a breast uh, evidence-based breastfeeding support practice. It's on our key driver diagram. It's a critical practice. Um, that has so many benefits to parents and infants. We are, our goal is to use this for baseline for future work. And ultimately, it's going to help you systematically understand the uptake of this practice at your hospital. And sort of going back to our IHI model for improvement, this middle question, how are we going to know if we're making an improvement? We need to measure. And so with that, um, I'll leave you with um, next steps. So our goal is to have um, our NICUs level two to four um, participate in this audit, um, similar to how you've been participating in our ONN um, audits for um, our initiative. We would love um, to have all of you participate in this audit. 
um, for kangaroo care. And I hope that we approach it with the spirit of this beautiful baby from the Stanford website. Um, if your data contact is not going like the typical data contact that um, has been inputting data is not going to be the lead for this audit. We have a QR code here in the bottom and we can also put it in the um, we'll put it in the email, of course, and the, with the link um, so we can have their contact information. We're going to email send an email out with this recording on a one pager um, and the tools. And again, we have this office hours scheduled for October 17th with the plan to kick off the audit the week of October 20th. The GAP QC team, the Department of Public Health, Georgia AAP, Dr. Parker, Dr. Frankel, uh, Grady NICU, and um, my funder the for my time, Emory K-12, the Birch, and love to open it up for um, questions and thoughts. And thank you all for your attention. I will stop sharing. <laughs>